If I Were a Man by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. If I Were a Man, that was what pretty little Molly Matthewson always said when Gerald would not do what she wanted him to, which was sell them. That was what she said this bright morning with a stamp of her little high-heeled slipper just because he had made a fuss about that bill, the long one with the account rendered, which she had forgotten to give him the first time and been afraid this to the second. And now he had taken it from the postman himself. So when women spent money, it was all through the man's bank account. Women couldn't have bank accounts. So if if they spent money, came out of the, the guy's bank account, she would have to either conceal it or tell him straight up because then the bank would send the statement and he'd find out. And so that's where she's at. Molly was a true type. I hope you're noticing too that she's pretty little Molly and that she's wearing high-heeled slippers. <clears throat> Molly was true to type. She was a beautiful instance of what is rever reverentially, reverence, reverend, reverentially called a true woman. Little, of course. No true ma woman may be big. Pretty, of course. No true woman would possibly be plain, whimsical, capricious, charming, changeable, devoted to pretty clothes, and always wearing them well, as the esoteric phrase has it. This does not refer to the clothes they do not wear well in the least but to some special grace of putting them on and carrying them about, granted to but few, it appears. So is that what it's like being a woman? You have to, um, you, you have to be little, of course. No true woman can be big. You have to be pretty, of course. No true woman can be plain. You gotta be whimsical, capricious, charming, changeable, devoted to pretty clothes and always wear them well. I mean, I, I hear Barb not saying those words, but saying that that's how she feels sometimes. Um, you know, she can't go to her job in yoga pants. She was also a loving wife and a devoted mother, possessed of the social gift and the love of society that goes with it. And with all these was fond and proud of her home and managed it as capably as, well, as most women do. If ever there was a true woman, it was Molly Matthewson. Yet she was wishing heart and soul she was a man. And all of a sudden, she was. She was Gerald, walking down the path, so erect and square-shouldered, in a hurry for his morning train, as usual, and, it must be confessed, in something of a temper. Her own words were ringing in her ears, not only the last word, but several that had gone before, and she was holding her lips tight shut, not to say any something that she would be sorry for, but instead of acquiescence in the pos position taken by that angry little figure on the veranda, which she felt was a sort of superior pride, a sympathy as with weakness, a feeling that I must be gentle with her in spite of the temper. A man, really a man, with only enough subconscious memory of herself remaining to make her recognize the differences, at first, there was a funny sense of size and weight and extra thickness. The feet and hands seemed strangely large, and her long, straight, free legs swung forward at a gait that made her feel as if she was on stilts. This pre presently passed, and in its place, growing all day wherever she went, came a new and delightful feeling of being the right size. Everything fitted now. Her back snugly against the seat back, her feet comfortably on the floor, her feet, his feet. She studied them carefully. Never before since her early school days had she felt such freedom and comfort as to feet. They were firm and solid on the ground when she walked, quick, springy, safe. As when moved by an unrecognizable impulse, she had run after, caught, and swung aboard the car. Hmm. Uh, you know, like walking on high heels or on heels at any kind of heels. Another impulse fished in a convenient pocket for change and instantly, automatically bringing forth a nickel for the conductor and a penny for the newsboy. These pockets came as a revelation. Of course, she had known they were there, had counted them, made fun of them, mended them, even envied them, but she never had dreamed of how it felt to have pockets. Behind her newspaper, 
she let her consciousness, that odd mingled consciousness, rove from pocket to pocket, realizing the armored assurance of having all those things at hand instantly get it gettable, ready to meet emergencies. The cigar case gave her a warm feeling of comfort. It was full, the firmly held fountain pen, safe unless she stood on her head. The keys, pencils, letters, documents, notebook, checkbook, bill folder, all at once, with a deep rushing sense of power and pride, she felt what she had never felt before in all her life. The possession of money, of her own earned money, hers to give or to withhold, not to beg for, tease for, wheedle for, hers. That bill, why, if it had come to her, to him, that is, he would have paid it as a matter of course and never mentioned it to her. Then, being he, sitting there so easily and firmly with his money in his pockets, she wakened to his lifelong consciousness about money, boyhood, its desires and dreams, ambitions, young manhood, working tremendously for the wherewithal to make a home for her, the present years with all their net and cares and hopes and dangers, the present moment when he needed every cent for special plans of great importance, and this bill, long overdue and demanding payment, meant an amount of inconvenience wholly unnecessary if it had been given him when it first came. Also, the man's keen dislike of that account rendered. Women have no business sense, she found herself saying, and all that money just for hats, idiotic, useless, ugly things. With that, she began to see the hats of the women in the car as she had never seen hats before. The men seemed normal, dignified, becoming, with enough variety for personal taste and that and with distinction in style and in age such as she had never noticed before but the women's with the eyes of a man and the brain of a man with the memory of a whole lifetime of free action wherein the hat close fitting on cropped hair had been no handicap she now perceived the hats of women the mass fluffed hair was at once attractive and foolish and on that hair at every angle in all colors tipped twisted tortured into every crooked shape made of any substance chance might offer, perched these formless objects, then on their formlessness, the trimmings, these squ squirts of stiff feathers, these violent outstanding boughs of glistening ribbon, these swaying projecting masses of plumage which tormented the faces of bystanders. Never in all her life had she imagined that this idolized m millinery could look to those who paid for it, like the decorations of an insane monkey. And yet, when there came into the car a little woman, as foolish as any, but pretty and sweet-looking, up rose Gerald Matheson and gave her his seat. And later, when there came in a handsome red-cheeked girl, whose hat was whiter, wilder, more violent in color and eccentric in shape than any other, when she stood nearby and her soft curling plume swept his cheek once and again, he felt a sense of sudden pleasure at the intimate tickling touch, and she, deep down within, felt such a wave of shame as might well drown a thousand hats forever. When he took his train, his seat in the smoking car, she had a new surprise. All about him were the other men, compu commuters too, and many of them friends of his. To her, they would have been distinguished as Mary Wade's husband, the man Bell Grant is engaged to, that rich Mr. Shopworth, or that pleasant Mrs. Mr. Beale, and they would <clears throat> all have lifted their hats to her, bowed, made polite conversation if near enough, especially Mr. Beale. Now came the feeling of open-eyed acquaintance, of knowing men <clears throat> as they were. The mere amount of this knowledge was a surprise to her. The whole background of talk from boyhood up, the gossip of barbershop and club, the conversation of morning and evening hours on trains, the knowledge of political affiliation, of business standing and prospects, of character in a light she had never known before. <clears throat> they came and talked to Gerald, one and another. He seemed quite popular, and as they talked with this new memory and new understanding, an understanding which seemed to include all these men's minds, were poured in on the submerged consciousness beneath a new and startling knowledge what men really think of women. Good average american men were there married men for the most part and happy as happiness goes in general in the minds of each of all these there seemed to be a two-story department 
quite apart from the rest of their ideas, a separate place where they kept their thoughts and feelings about women. In the upper half <clears throat> were the tenderest emotions, the most exquisite ideals, the sweetest memories, all lovely sentiments as to home and mother, all delicate admiring adjectives, a sort of sanctuary where a veiled statue blindly adored shared place with beloved yet commonplace experiences. In the lower half here, the buried consciousness woke to keen distress. They kept quiet another assortment of ideas. Here, even in this clean-minded husband of hers, was the memory of stories told at men's dinners, of worse ones overheard in a streetcar or street or car, or base traditions, coarse epithets, gross experiences, known though not shared. And all of these in the department woman, while in the rest of the mind, here was the not new knowledge indeed. The world opened before her, not the world she had been reared in, where home had covered all the map almost, and the rest had been foreign or unexplored country, but the world as it was, man's world, as made, lived in, and seen by men. It was dizzying to see the houses that fled so fast across the car window in terms of builders, bills, or of some technical insight into materials and methods, to see a passing village with lamentable knowledge of who owned it and how its boss was rapidly aspiring in state power, or of how that kind of paving was a failure, to see shops not as mere exhibitions of desirable objects, but as business ventures. Many were sinking ships, some promising a profitable, profitable voyage. This new world bewildered her. She, as Gerald, had already forgotten about that bill over which she, as Molly, was still crying at home. Gerald was on, was talking business with this man, talking politics with that, and now sympathizing with the carefully withheld troubles of a neighbor. Molly had always sympathized with the neighbor's wife before. She began to struggle violently with this large, dominant masculine consciousness. She remembered with sudden clearness things she had read lectures she had heard and resented with increasing intensity the serene masculine preoccupation with the male point of view. Mr. Miles, the little fussy man who lived on the other side of the street, was talking now. He had a large, complacent wife. Molly had never liked her much, but had always thought him rather nice. He was so punctilious in small courtesies. And here he was talking to Gerald, such talk. Had to come in here, he said. Gave my seat to a dame who was bound to have it. There's nothing they won't get when they make up their minds to, to it, eh? No fear, said the big man in the next seat. They haven't much mind to make up, you know? If And if they do, they'll change it. The real danger, began the Reverend Alfred Smythe, the new Episcopal clergyman, a thin, nervous, tall man with a face several centuries behind the times, is that they'll overstep the limits of their God-appointed sphere. Their natural limits ought to hold them, I think, said cheerful Dr. Jones. You can't get around psycho physiolog physio you can't get around physiology, I tell you. <clears throat> I've never seen any limits myself, not to what they want, anyhow, said Mr. Miles. Merely a rich husband and a fine house and no end of bonnets and dresses and the latest thing in motors and a few diamonds and so on keeps us pretty busy there was a tired gray man across the aisle he had a nice wife always beautifully dressed and three unmarried daughters also beautifully dressed molly knew them she knew he worked hard too and she looked at him now a little anxiously but he smiled cheerfully do you good, Miles, he said. What else would a man work for? A good woman is about the best thing on earth. And a bad one's the worst, that's sure. She's a pretty weak sister, viewed professionally, Dr. Jones averred <clears throat> with solemnity. And the Reverend Alvin Smythe added, she brought evil into the world. Gerald Matthewson sat up straight. Something was stirring in him, which he did not recognize, yet could not resist. Seems to me <clears throat> we all talk like Noah, he suggested dryly, or the ancient Hindu scriptures. Women have their limitations, but so do we. God knows. Haven't we known girls in school and college just as smart as we were? They cannot 
play our games, coldly replied the clergyman. Gerald measured his meager proportions with a practice eye. I never was particularly good at football myself, he modestly admitted, but I've known women who could outlast a man in all-around endurance. Besides, life isn't spent in athletics. This was sadly true. They all looked down the aisle where a heavy, ill-dressed man with a bad complexion sat alone. He had held the top of the columns once with headlines and paragraphs. Now he earned less than any of them. <clears throat> it's time we woke up, pursued Gerald, still inwardly urged to unfamiliar speech. Women are pretty much people, seems to me. I know they dress like fools, but who's to blame for that? We invent all these idiotic hats of theirs and design their crazy fashions, and what's more, if a woman is courageous enough to wear common sense clothes and shoes, which of us wants to dance with her? Yes, we blame them for gra grafting on us, but are we willing to let our wives work? We are not. It hurts our pride, that's all. We always criticizing them for making mercenary marriages, but what do we call a girl who marries a chump with no money? Just a poor fool, that's all, and they know it. As for Mother Eve, I wasn't there. I can't deny the story, but I will say this. If she brought evil into the world, we men have had the lion's share of keeping it going over ever since. How about that? They drew into the city, and all day long in, the, in his business, Gerald was vaguely conscious of new views, strange feelings, and the submerged Molly learned and learned... She invented woke, guys. It says right there, it's time we woke up.